Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. Palzunkov by Fyodor Dostoevsky A story I began to scrutinize the man closely. Even in his exterior there was something so peculiar that it compelled one, however far away one's thoughts might be, to fix one's eyes upon him and go off into the most irrepressible roar of laughter. That is what happened to me. I must observe that the little man's eyes were so mobile, or perhaps he was so sensitive to the magnetism of every eye fixed upon him, that he almost by instinct guessed that he was being observed, turned at once to the observer and anxiously analyzed his expression. His continual mobility, his turning and twisting, made him look strikingly like a dancing doll. It was strange. He seemed afraid of jeers, in spite of the fact that he was almost getting his living by being a buffoon for all the world, and exposed himself to every buffet in a moral sense and even in a physical one, judging from the company he was in. Voluntary buffoons are not even to be pitted. But I noticed at once that this strange creature, this ridiculous man, was by no means a buffoon by profession. There was still something gentlemanly in him. His very uneasiness, his continual apprehensiveness about himself, were actually a testimony in his favor. It seemed to me that his desire to be obliging was due more to kindness of heart than to mercenary considerations. He readily allowed them to laugh their loudest at him and in the most unseemly way, to his face, but at the same time, and I am ready to take my oath on it, his heart ached and was sore at the thought that his listeners were so cattishly brutal as to be capable of laughing, not at anything said or done, but at him, at his whole being, at his heart, at his head, at his appearance, at his whole body, flesh and blood. I am convinced that he felt at that moment all the foolishness of his position, but the protest died away in his heart at once, though it invariably sprang up again in the most heroic way. I am convinced that all this was due to nothing else but a kind heart, and not to fear of the inconvenience of being kicked out and being unable to borrow money from someone. This gentleman was forever borrowing money, that is, he asked for alms in that form, when after playing the fool and entertaining them at his expense he felt in a certain sense entitled to borrow money from them. But, good heavens! What a business the borrowing was! and with what a countenance he asked for the loan. I could not have imagined that on such a small space as the wrinkled, angular face of that little man room could be found, at one and the same time, for so many different grimaces, for such strange, variously characteristic shades of feeling, such absolutely killing expressions. Everything was there, shame and an assumption of insolence, and vexation at the sudden flushing of his face, and anger and fear of failure, an entreaty to be forgiven for having dared to pester, and a sense of his own dignity, and a still greater sense of his own abjectness, all this passed over his face like lightning. For six whole years he had struggled along in God's world in this way, and so far had been unable to take up a fitting attitude at the interesting moment of borrowing money. I need not say that he never could grow callous and completely abject. His heart was too sensitive, too passionate. I will say more, indeed, in my opinion, he was one of the most honest and honorable men in the world, but with a little weakness, of being ready to do anything abject at anyone's bidding, good-naturedly and disinterestedly, simply to oblige a fellow creature. In short, he was what is called, a rag, in the fullest sense of the word. The most absurd thing was, that he was dressed like anyone else, neither worse nor better, tidily, even with a certain elaborateness, and actually had pretensions to respectability and personal dignity. This external equality and internal inequality, his uneasiness about himself and at the same time his continual self-depreciation, all this was strikingly incongruous and provocative of laughter and pity. If he had been convinced in his heart, and in spite of his experience it did happen to him at moments to believe this, that his audience were the most good-natured people in the world, who were simply laughing at something amusing, and not at the sacrifice of his personal dignity, he would most readily have taken off his coat, 
put it on wrong side outwards, and have walked about the streets in that attire for the diversion of others and his own gratification. But equality he could never anyhow attain. Another trait, the queer fellow was proud, and even, by fits and starts, when it was not too risky, generous. It was worth seeing and hearing how he could sometimes, not sparing himself, consequently with pluck, almost with heroism, dispose of one of his patrons who had infuriated him to madness. But that was at moments. In short, he was a martyr in the fullest sense of the word, but the most useless and consequently the most comic martyr. There was a general discussion going on among the guests. All at once I saw our queer friend jump upon his chair, and call out at the top of his voice, anxious for the exclusive attention of the company. Listen, the master of the house whispered to me. He sometimes tells the most curious stories. Does he interest you? I nodded and squeezed myself into the group. The sight of a well-dressed gentleman jumping upon his chair and shouting at the top of his voice did, in fact, draw the attention of all. Many who did not know the queer fellow looked at one another in perplexity, the others roared with laughter. I knew Fetusy Nikolaitch. I ought to know Fetusy Nikolaitch better than any one, cried the queer fellow from his elevation. Gentlemen, allow me to tell you something. I can tell you a good story about Fetusy Nikolaitch. I know a story, exquisite. Tell it, Osip Mihalich, tell it. Tell it. Listen. Listen, listen. I begin, but, gentlemen, this is a peculiar story. Very good, very good. It's a comic story. Very good, excellent, splendid. Get on. It is an episode in the private life of your humble. But why do you trouble yourself to announce that it's comic? And even somewhat tragic. Eh? In short, the story which it will afford you all pleasure to hear me now relate, gentlemen, the story, in consequence of which I have come into company so interesting and profitable. No puns. This story. In short the story, make haste and finish the introduction. The story, which has its value, a fair-haired young man with mustaches pronounced in a husky voice, dropping his hand into his coat pocket and, as though by chance, pulling out a purse instead of his handkerchief. The story, my dear sirs, after which I should like to see many of you in my place. And, finally, the story, in consequence of which I have not married. Married. A wife. Polzunkov tried to get married. I confess I should like to see Madame Polzunkov. Allow me to inquire the name of the would-be Madame Polzunkov, piped a youth, making his way up to the storyteller. And so for the first chapter, gentlemen. It was just six years ago, in spring, the 31st of March, note the date, gentlemen, on the eve. Of the 1st of April, cried a young man with ringlets. You are extraordinarily quick at guessing. It was evening. Twilight was gathering over the district town of N, the moon was about to float out, everything in proper style, in fact. And so in the very late twilight I, too, floated out of my poor lodging on the sly, after taking leave of my restricted granny, now dead. Excuse me, gentlemen, for making use of such a fashionable expression, which I heard for the last time from Nikolai Nikolaitch. But my granny was indeed restricted, she was blind, dumb, deaf, stupid, everything you please. I confess I was in a tremor, I was prepared for great deeds, my heart was beating like a kitten's when some bony hand clutches it by the scruff of the neck. Excuse me, Monsieur Polzunkov. What do you want? Tell it more simply, don't overexert yourself, please. All right, said Osip Mihalich, a little taken aback. I went into the house of Fetusy Nikolaitch, the house that he had bought. Fetusy Nikolaitch, as you know, is not a mere colleague, but the full-blown head of a department. I was announced, and was at once shown into the study. I can see it now, the room was dark, almost dark, but candles were not brought. Behold, Fetusy Nikolaitch walks in. 
There he and I were left in the darkness. Whatever happened to you? asked an officer. What do you suppose? asked Polzunkov, turning promptly, with a convulsively working face, to the young man with ringlets. Well, gentlemen, a strange circumstance occurred, though indeed there was nothing strange in it, it was what is called an everyday affair, I simply took out of my pocket a roll of paper, and he a roll of paper. Paper notes? Paper notes, and we exchanged. I don't mind betting that there's a flavor of bribery about it, observed a respectably dressed, closely cropped young gentleman. Bribery. Polzunkov caught him up. Oh, may I be a liberal, such as many I have seen. If you, too, when it is your lot to serve in the provinces, do not warm your hands at your country's hearth. For as an author said, even the smoke of our native land is sweet to us. She is our mother, gentlemen, our mother Russia, we are her babes, and so we suck her. There was a roar of laughter. Only would you believe it, gentlemen, I have never taken bribes, said Polzunkov, looking round at the whole company distrustfully. A prolonged burst of Homeric laughter drowned Polzunkov's words in guffaws. It really is so, gentlemen. But here he stopped, still looking round at every one with a strange expression of face, perhaps, who knows, at that moment the thought came into his mind that he was more honest than many of all that honorable company. Anyway, the serious expression of his face did not pass away till the general merriment was quite over. And so, Polzunkov began again when all was still, though I never did take bribes, yet that time I transgressed, I put in my pocket a bribe, from a bribe-taker, that is, there were certain papers in my hands which, if I had cared to send to a certain person, it would have gone ill with Fidesi Nikolaitch. So then he bought them from you? He did. Did he give much? He gave as much as many a man nowadays would sell his conscience for complete, with all its variations, if only he could get anything for it. But I felt as though I were scalded when I put the money in my pocket. I really don't understand what always comes over me, gentlemen, but I was more dead than alive, my lips twitched and my legs trembled, well, I was to blame, to blame, entirely to blame. I was utterly conscience-stricken, I was ready to beg Fidesi Nikolaitch's forgiveness. Well, what did he do, did he forgive you? But I didn't ask his forgiveness. I only mean that that is how I felt. Then I have a sensitive heart, you know. I saw he was looking me straight in the face. Have you no fear of God, Osip Mihailich, said he. Well, what could I do? From a feeling of propriety I put my head on one side and I flung up my hands. In what way, said I, have I no fear of God, Fidesi Nikolaitch? But I just said that from a feeling of propriety. I was ready to sink into the earth. After being so long a friend of our family, after being, I may say, like a son, and who knows what heaven had in store for us, Osip Mihailich, and all of a sudden to inform against me, to think of that now. What am I to think of mankind after that, Osip Mihailich? Yes, gentlemen, he did read me a lecture. Come, he said, you tell me what I am to think of mankind after that, Osip Mihailich. What is he to think? I thought, and do you know, there was a lump in my throat, and my voice was quivering, and knowing my hateful weakness, I snatched up my hat. Where are you off to, Osip Mihailich? Surely on the eve of such a day you cannot bear malice against me? What wrong have I done you? Fidesi Nikolaitch, I said, Fidesi Nikolaitch. In fact, I melted, gentlemen, I melted like a sugar stick. And the roll of notes that was lying in my pocket, that, too, seemed screaming out, you ungrateful brigand, you accursed thief. It seemed to weigh a hundredweight. If only it had weighed a hundredweight. I see, says Fidesi Nikolaitch, I see your penitence, you know tomorrow. St. Mary of Egypt's day. Well, don't weep, said Fidesi Nikolaitch, that's enough, you've erred, and you are penitent. Come along. Maybe I may succeed in bringing you back again into the true path, 
says he. Maybe, my modest Panades, yes, Panades, I remember he used that expression, the rascal, will warm, says he, your harden. I will not say hardened, but erring heart. He took me by the arm, gentlemen, and led me to his family circle. A cold shiver ran down my back, I shuddered. I thought with what eyes shall I present myself, you must know, gentlemen, eh, uh, what shall I say, a delicate position had arisen here. Not Madame Polzunkov? Maria Fedosievna, only she was not destined, you know, to bear the name you have given her, she did not attain that honor. Fedosy Nikolaitch was right, you see, when he said that I was almost looked upon as a son in the house, it had been so, indeed, six months before, when a certain retired junker called Mihailo Maximich Dvigilov, was still living. But by God's will he died, and he put off settling his affairs till death settled his business for him. Oof! Well, never mind, gentlemen, forgive me, it was a slip of the tongue. It's a bad pun, but it doesn't matter it's being bad, what happened was far worse, when I was left, so to say, with nothing in prospect but a bullet through the brain, for that junker, though he would not admit me into his house, he lived in grand style, for he had always known how to feather his nest, yet perhaps correctly he believed me to be his son. Aha! Yes, that was how it was. So they began to cold-shoulder me at Fetusy Nikolaitch's. I noticed things, I kept quiet, but all at once, unluckily for me, or perhaps luckily, a cavalry officer galloped into our little town like snow on our head. His business, buying horses for the army, was light and active, in cavalry style, but he settled himself solidly at Fetusy Nikolaitch's, as though he were laying siege to it. I approached the subject in a roundabout way, as my nasty habit is, I said one thing and another, asking him what I had done to be treated so, saying that I was almost like a son to him, and when might I expect him to behave more like a father? Well, he began answering me. And when he begins to speak you are in for a regular epic in twelve cantos, and all you can do is to listen, lick your lips and throw up your hands in delight. And not a hoppy orth of sense, at least there's no making out the sense. You stand puzzled like a fool, he puts you in a fog, he twists about like an eel and wriggles away from you. It's a special gift, a real gift, it's enough to frighten people even if it is no concern of theirs. I tried one thing and another, and went hither and thither. I took the lady songs and presented her with sweets and thought of witty things to say to her. I tried sighing and groaning. My heart aches, I said, it aches from love. And I went in for tears and secret explanations. Man is foolish, you know. I never reminded myself that I was thirty, not a bit of it. I tried all my arts. It was no go. It was a failure, and I gained nothing but jeers and jibes. I was indignant, I was choking with anger. I slunk off and would not set foot in the house. I thought and thought and made up my mind to denounce him. Well, of course, it was a shabby thing, I meant to give away a friend, I confess. I had heaps of material and splendid material, a grand case. It brought me fifteen hundred rubles when I changed it and my report on it for bank notes. Ah, so that was the bribe. Yes, sir, that was the bribe, and it was a bribe-taker who had to pay it, and I didn't do wrong, I can assure you. Well, now I will go on, he drew me, if you will kindly remember, more dead than alive into the room where they were having tea. They all met me, seeming as it were offended, that is, not exactly offended, but hurt, so hurt that it was simply. They seemed shattered, absolutely shattered, and at the same time there was a look of becoming dignity on their faces, a gravity in their expression, something fatherly, parental, the prodigal son had come back to them, that's what it had come to. They made me sit down to tea, but there was no need to do that, I felt as though a samovar was toiling in my bosom and my feet were like ice. I was humbled, I was cowed. Maria Fominishna, his wife, addressed me familiarly from the first word. 
how is it you have grown so thin, my boy? I've not been very well, Maria Faminishna, I said. My wretched voice shook. And then quite suddenly, she must have been waiting for a chance to get a dig at me, the old snake, she said, I suppose your conscience felt ill at ease, Osip Mihalich, my dear. Our fatherly hospitality was a reproach to you. You have been punished for the tears I have shed. Yes, upon my word, she really said that, she had the conscience to say it. Why, that was nothing to her, she was a terror. She did nothing but sit there and pour out tea. But if you were in the market, my darling, I thought you'd shout louder than any fishwife there. That's the kind of woman she was. And then, to my undoing, the daughter, Maria Fedosievna, came in, in all her innocence, a little pale and her eyes red as though she had been weeping. I was bowled over on the spot like a fool. But it turned out afterwards that the tears were a tribute to the cavalry officer. He had made tracks for home and taken his hook for good and all, for you know it was high time for him to be off, I may as well mention the fact here, not that his leave was up precisely, but you see. It was only later that the loving parents grasped the position and had found out all that had happened. What could they do? They hushed their trouble up, an addition to the family. Well, I could not help it, as soon as I looked at her I was done for, I stole a glance at my hat, I wanted to get up and make off. But there was no chance of that, they took away my hat. I must confess, I did think of getting off without it. Well. I thought, but no, they latched the doors. There followed friendly jokes, winking, little airs and graces. I was overcome with embarrassment, said something stupid, talked nonsense, about love. My charmer sat down to the piano and with an air of wounded feeling sang the song about the hussar who leaned upon the sword, that finished me off. Well, said Fetusy Nikolaitch, all is forgotten, come to my arms. I fell just as I was, with my face on his waistcoat. My benefactor. You are a father to me, said I. And I shed floods of hot tears. Lord, have mercy on us, what a to-do there was. He cried, his good lady cried, Mashenka cried. There was a flaxen-headed creature there, she cried too. That wasn't enough, the younger children crept out of all the corners, the Lord had filled their quiver full, and they howled too. Such tears, such emotion, such joy. They found their prodigal, it was like a soldier's return to his home. Then followed refreshments, we played forfeits, and, I have a pain, where is it? In my heart, who gave it you? My charmer blushed. The old man and I had some punch, they won me over and did for me completely. I returned to my grandmother with my head in a whirl. I was laughing all the way home, for full two hours I paced up and down our little room. I waked up my old granny and told her of my happiness. But did he give you any money, the brigand? He did, granny, he did, my dear, luck has come to us all of a heap, we've only to open our hand and take it. I waked up Sofran. Sofran, I said, take off my boots. Sofran pulled off my boots. Come, Sofran, congratulate me now, give me a kiss. I am going to get married, my lad, I am going to get married. You can get jolly drunk tomorrow, you can have a spree, my dear soul, your master is getting married. My heart was full of jokes and laughter. I was beginning to drop off to sleep, but something made me get up again. I sat and thought, tomorrow is the first of April, a bright and playful day, what should I do? And I thought of something. Why, gentlemen, I got out of bed, lighted a candle, and sat down to the writing table just as I was. I was in a fever of excitement, quite carried away, you know, gentlemen, what it is when a man is quite carried away. I wallowed joyfully in the mud, my dear friends. You see what I am like, they take something from you, and you give them something else as well and say, take that, too. They strike you on the cheek and in your joy you offer them your whole back. 
Then they try to lure you like a dog with a bun, and you embrace them with your foolish paws and fall to kissing them with all your heart and soul. Why, see what I am doing now, gentlemen. You are laughing and whispering, I see it. After I have told you all my story you will begin to turn me into ridicule, you will begin to attack me, but yet I go on talking and talking and talking. And who tells me to? Who drives me to do it? Who is standing behind my back whispering to me, speak, speak and tell them? And yet I do talk, I go on telling you, I try to please you as though you were my brothers, all my dearest friends. Eck. The laughter which had sprung up by degrees on all sides completely drowned at last the voice of the speaker, who really seemed worked up into a sort of ecstasy. He paused, for several minutes his eyes strayed about the company, then suddenly, as though carried away by a whirlwind, he waved his hand, burst out laughing himself, as though he really found his position amusing, and fell to telling his story again. I scarcely slept all night, gentlemen. I was scribbling all night, you see, I thought of a trick. Eck, gentlemen, the very thought of it makes me ashamed. It wouldn't have been so bad if it all had been done at night, I might have been drunk, blundered, been silly and talked nonsense, but not a bit of it. I woke up in the morning as soon as it was light, I hadn't slept more than an hour or two, and was in the same mind. I dressed, I washed, I curled and pomaded my hair, put on my new dress coat and went straight off to spend the holiday with Fetusy Nikolaich, and I kept the joke I had written in my hat. He met me again with open arms, and invited me again to his fatherly waistcoat. But I assumed an air of dignity. I had the joke I thought of the night before in my mind. I drew a step back. No, Fetusy Nikolaich, but will you please read this letter? and I gave it him together with my daily report. And do you know what was in it? Why, for such and such reasons the aforesaid Osip Mihalich asks to be discharged, and under my petition I signed my full rank. Just think what a notion. Good Lord, it was the cleverest thing I could think of. As today was the first of April, I was pretending, for the sake of a joke, that my resentment was not over, that I had changed my mind in the night and was grumpy, and more offended than ever, as though to say, my dear benefactor, I don't want to know you nor your daughter either. I put the money in my pocket yesterday, so I am secure, so here's my petition for a transfer to be discharged. I don't care to serve under such a chief as Fetusy Nikolaich. I want to go into a different office and then, maybe, I'll inform. I pretended to be a regular scoundrel. I wanted to frighten them. And a nice way of frightening them, wasn't it? A pretty thing, gentlemen, wasn't it? You see, my heart had grown tender towards them since the day before, so I thought I would have a little joke at the family, I would tease the fatherly heart of Fetusy Nikolaich. As soon as he took my letter and opened it, I saw his whole countenance change. What's the meaning of this, Osip Mihalich? And like a little fool I said, the first of April. Many happy returns of the day, Fetusy Nikolaich, just like a silly schoolboy who hides behind his grandmother's armchair and then shouts, oof, into her ear suddenly at the top of his voice, meaning to frighten her. Yes, yes, I feel quite ashamed to talk about it, gentlemen. No, I won't tell you. Nonsense. What happened then? Nonsense, nonsense. Tell us. Yes, do, rose on all sides. There was an outcry and a hullabaloo, my dear friends. Such exclamations of surprise. And, you mischievous fellow, you naughty man, and what a fright I had given them, and all so sweet that I felt ashamed and wondered how such a holy place could be profaned by a sinner like me. Well, my dear boy, piped the mama. You gave me such a fright that my legs are all of a tremble still, I can hardly stand on my feet. I ran to Masha as though I were crazy, Mashenka, I said, what will become of us? See how your friend has turned out, and I was unjust to you, my dear boy. You must forgive an old woman like me, I was taken in. 
Well, I thought, when he got home last night, he got home late, he began thinking and perhaps he fancied that we sent for him on purpose, yesterday, that we wanted to get hold of him. I turned cold at the thought. Give over, Mashenka, don't go on winking at me, Osip Mihalich isn't a stranger. I am your mother, I am not likely to say any harm. Thank God, I am not twenty, but turned forty-five. Well, gentlemen, I almost flopped at her feet on the spot. Again there were tears, again there were kisses. Jokes began. Fetusy Nikolaitch, too, thought he would make April fools of us. He told us the fiery bird had flown up with a letter in her diamond beak. He tried to take us in, too, didn't we laugh? Weren't we touched? Foo! I feel ashamed to talk about it. Well, my good friends, the end is not far off now. One day passed, two, three, a week, I was regularly engaged to her. I should think so. The wedding rings were ordered, the day was fixed, only they did not want to make it public for a time, they wanted to wait for the inspector's visit to be over. I was all impatience for the inspector's arrival, my happiness depended upon him. I was in a hurry to get his visit over. And in the excitement and rejoicing Fetusy Nikolaitch threw all the work upon me, writing up the accounts, making up the reports, checking the books, balancing the totals. I found things in terrible disorder, everything had been neglected, there were muddles and irregularities everywhere. Well, I thought, I must do my best for my father-in-law. And he was ailing all the time, he was taken ill, it appears, he seemed to get worse day by day. And, indeed, I grew as thin as a rake myself, I was afraid I would break down. However, I finished the work grandly. I got things straight for him in time. Suddenly they sent a messenger for me. I ran headlong, what could it be? I saw my fetusy Nikolaitch, his head bandaged up in a vinegar compress, frowning, sighing, and moaning. My dear boy, my son, he said, if I die, to whom shall I leave you, my darlings? His wife trailed in with all his children, Mashenka was in tears and I blubbered, too. Oh no, he said. God will be merciful, he will not visit my transgressions on you. Then he dismissed them all, told me to shut the door after them, and we were left alone, tete tete. I have a favor to ask of you. What favor? Well, my dear boy, there is no rest for me even on my deathbed. I am in want. How so? I positively flushed crimson, I could hardly speak. Why, I had to pay some of my own money into the treasury. I grudge nothing for the public wheel, my boy. I don't grudge my life. Don't you imagine any ill. I am sad to think that slanderers have blackened my name to you. You were mistaken, my hair has gone white from grief. The inspector is coming down upon us and Matveyev is 7,000 rubles short, and I shall have to answer for it. Who else? It will be visited upon me, my boy, where were my eyes? And how can we get it from Matveyev? He has had trouble enough already, why should I bring the poor fellow to ruin? Holy saints! I thought, what a just man! What a heart! And I don't want to take my daughter's money, which has been set aside for her dowry, that sum is sacred. I have money of my own, it's true, but I have lent it all to friends, how is one to collect it all in a minute? I simply fell on my knees before him. My benefactor! I cried, I've wronged you, I have injured you, it was slanderers who wrote against you, don't break my heart, take back your money. He looked at me and there were tears in his eyes. That was just what I expected from you, my son. Get up. I forgave you at the time for the sake of my daughter's tears, now my heart forgives you freely. You have healed my wounds. I bless you for all time. Well, when he blessed me, gentlemen, I scurried home as soon as I could. I got the money, here, father, here's the money. I've only spent fifty rubles. Well, that's all right, he said. 
But now every trifle may count, the time is short, write a report dated some days ago that you were short of money and had taken fifty rubles on account. I'll tell the authorities you had it in advance. Well, gentlemen, what do you think? I did write that report, too. Well, what then? What happened? How did it end? As soon as I had written the report, gentlemen, this is how it ended. The next day, in the early morning, an envelope with a government seal arrived. I looked at it and what had I got? The sack. That is, instructions to hand over my work, to deliver the accounts, and to go about my business. How so? That's just what I cried at the top of my voice, how so? Gentlemen, there was a ringing in my ears. I thought there was no special reason for it, but no, the inspector had arrived in the town. My heart sank. It's not for nothing, I thought. And just as I was I rushed off to feed to see Nikolaich. How is this? I said. What do you mean, he said. Why, I am dismissed. Dismissed? How? Why, look at this. Well, what of it? Why, but I didn't ask for it. Yes, you did, you sent in your papers on the 1st of, April. I had never taken that letter back. Fidesi Nikolaich. I can't believe my ears, I can't believe my eyes. Is this you? It is me, why? My God. I am sorry, sir. I am very sorry that you made up your mind to retire from the service so early. A young man ought to be in the service, and you've begun to be a little light-headed of late. And as for your character, set your mind at rest, I'll see to that. Your behavior has always been so exemplary. But that was a little joke, Fidesi Nikolaich. I didn't mean it, I just gave you the letter for your fatherly, that's all. That's all? A queer joke, sir. Does one jest with documents like that? Why, you are sometimes sent to Siberia for such jokes. Now, goodbye. I am busy. We have the inspector here, the duties of the service before everything, you can kick up your heels, but we have to sit here at work. But I'll get you a character, oh, another thing, I've just bought a house from Matveyev. We are moving in in a day or two. So I expect I shall not have the pleasure of seeing you at our new residence. Bon voyage. I ran home. We are lost, granny. She wailed, poor dear, and then I saw the page from Fidesi Nikolaich's running up with a note and a birdcage, and in the cage there was a starling. In the fullness of my heart I had given her the starling. And in the note there were the words, April 1st, and nothing more. What do you think of that? gentlemen. What happened then? What happened then? What then? I met Fidesi Nikolaich once, I meant to tell him to his face he was a scoundrel. Well? But somehow I couldn't bring myself to it, gentlemen. The end. Thank you for being with us until the end. We hope you had a wonderful time. If you enjoyed our book, please support us by liking and leaving comments. We look forward to seeing you soon with another book. Best regards.